open your ears. For which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I, from the Orient to the drooping West, making the wind my post-horse, still unfold the axe commence on this ball of earth. Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while covert enmity, under the smile of safety, wounds the world. And who but rumor, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepared defense, whilst the big year, swollen with some other grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war, and no such matter. Rumor is a pipe blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, the still discordant wavering multitude, can play upon it. But what need I thus my well-known body to anatomize among my household? Why is rumor here? I run before King Harry's victory, who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion even with the rebel's blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword, and that the king, before the Douglas' rage, stooped his anointed head as low as death. This have I rumored through the peasant towns between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone, where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. The posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learned of me. From rumor's tongues they bring smooth comforts false, worse than true wrongs. All right. Now, I don't have anything ready for the other guys. Huh? You got something for me? No. I'll pass on to Henry Fourth, but I have to recapture Henry Fourth Part One, because I'm doing Part Two tonight. And then next week, Henry the Fifth. This is a series of Shakespeare that is to finish all the Shakespeare plays. Now, Henry the Fourth is general in my recap. He reigned from 1399 to 1430. He was in Lancaster, West of England, the Beatles, huh? Liverpool, Merseyside, that year. And uh, he got the crown from Richard II. Come he tricked. And the first part of the play, uh, he had to fight an important battle at Shrewsbury to consolidate his reign. And the Scots were to come, the Welsh were to come, and there was the Yorkist defection from the Yorkshiremen. The Percy's, they fought in the Shrewsbury, oh God, the Welsh never came. And he won that battle, he sent his son John of Lancaster to the fight the Archbishop of York, and he was going to fight the Welsh, and the play ends there. In part two, uh, there's going to be a battle of God Tree Forest by his son John. He's going to beat the trick, I explained that just now, the forces of the Yorkists. But the king is going to die, and he's going to be succeeded by Henry V. And in the play, Henry V, Shakespeare is going to take up the challenge of what is a philosopher king? What is leadership? It's a frontal play to discuss leadership by Shakespeare. That's his hero, if you like, if you want to look at it in those godforsaken holidays. But Henry IV is to prepare the stage. There's some comic characters in the play, which you know, Pistol, Bardog, no, not Pistol, Bardog, and Paul Staff, I told you about those before. So, when the play opens, the king has defeated his enemies, and he sent his son and the Duke of Westmoreland to Yorkshire to fight a battle. He himself and Prince Hal, Henry V, his son, Prince of Wales, they are going to fight the Welsh. They never get there. 
Secondly, and this is important for you guys who are Platonists, a mystic named Peter of Pomfret said, you will die in Jerusalem to Henry IV. He would want to go on a crusade. The Pope organizes crusades. You see what he does? Say the French and the British and whoever to go and fight crusades. But when they're away, he manipulates their kingdoms, consolidates their reigns. If he wants to, if you go there and play to independent, you will get the Duke of Austria to capture you, Richard the Lionheart, and put him in a castle in Austria. He ran the world that way. Uh, you were supposed to believe he ran only in a, in a sense of sacredness. He was a very, sa the Pope has always been a secular figure. Oh, <coughs> and I can tell you some stories about some popes that will kill you, but leave it there. The trick of this, and I, I better spend a, well, uh, three minutes on this. In the Palace of Westminster, the, the British monarch has several palaces, Windsor, Westminster, you name it. Westminster, you should know, because that's where the Parliament is. Parliament is in the Palace of Westminster, so that's what that is. The favorite room of this king was a room called the Jerusalem Chamber. He used to rest there in Westminster and use that room a lot. So when this mystic says you will die in Jerusalem, you see the trick? <laughs> it's more probable than not. <laughs> and of course that's what happens. The king goes to Westminster to rest and he dies in Jerusalem, the chamber. That's important because that's how mystics operate. I always tell you guys the one about before the Greeks went to Troy, they went to the Oracle of Delphi. What will happen if we attack Troy and get back our Helen, this beautiful woman? And the Oracle said, a great empire will be lost. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't say what empire. So these stupid guys went and a great empire was lost. You know, a great empire was lost. So watch these prophecies and these ESP people and people with psychic this and psychic that, you know. I, I, uh, I knew a guy who used to be, when I was practicing law, a competent trickster. He would go on the racetrack and give every horse in the race. Somebody's bound to win. Mm -hmm. And the person who wins, ah, you're a great tipster. You know. So watch for those things. Watch for those things. Well, John of Lancaster was the second son, with the third son. I, in the English hierarchy, the first son is called the Prince of Wales. The second son is the Duke of York. The third son is the Duke of Lancaster. That's how they, they run their thing. Still the same. 1986 is still the same. They go to Yorkshire, a place called Galtree Forest, which is just outside the city of York. Now, York is a very important county in Britain. There's a town called York too. It's the largest county in Britain. It's on the east coast facing the uh, continent. And that is where much of the Boston, Massachusetts, joint stock company migration <coughs> from that area, Hartlepool, Yorkshire. And there's a Boston there. The place Boston is from there. The name Boston. That's where they got the name from. Hall. It's on the east coast. Right? <coughs> So it's good to know about Yorkshire. Andrew is the Duke of York who married a Fergie. You know. That's tell you how important it is. Incidentally, Wilson was from Yorkshire, the Prime Minister. Thatcher is the South. Pure English, you see? But Wilson was from Yorkshire. All right, having said that, John of Lancaster and the, his, all these people are related by blood. The Earl of Westmoreland, the Duke of Westmoreland, Westmoreland is a county in the west over Lancashire. It's called the Lake District, you know. Somewhere up here, up here, over here. It's called the Lake. That's where Wordsworth used to write his poetry, you know. And all those guys used to go and walk. <coughs> so they go to fight these troops which have rebelled against the king and are in Yorkshire. Whose troops are they? Northumberland, West East Coast people, Yorkists, and the Archbishop of York. In those days, there were two Archbishops really. The rest are bishops. You know, you remember how Constantine put the Roman the secret religions hierarchy into their 
Catholic Church, which is a church. And uh, history made the Archbishop of Canterbury the most important one. But Yorkshire wasn't so far behind. Wolsey was a Bishop of Yorkshire. What's happening there is, these are the days of Roman Catholicism. This is 1400, 1399 to 1413. The Pope runs the world. And you can only be Archbishop if the Pope agrees. And here are you with troops attacking the King of England. It's a papal balance of power operation. What happens when they get there? Well, first of all, the Scots are supposed to come and help them. The Northumberland people are supposed to come, but the guy that says, you know, the usual thing. I uh, think fence splitters are modern. The Duke of Northumberland says, look, I have to go and talk to the people in Scotland to get some reinforcements. He doesn't want to fight. He went north. When he came back with the Scots, when he was beaten up in Northumberland, up there by the sheriff of Northumberland, somebody like that. But ignoring. The Welsh were never fought because Henry died. Lancaster went down with Westmoreland and to fight these troops. And I must tell you what happened. I'm giving the narrative now. These guys are all ready to fight in Galtree Forest. And he goes and he says, let me, these are, do you, what are your terms? You want to fight a battle? What are your terms? What are your grievances? Remember what the American settlers did in there, in Philadelphia? They wrote their grievances out for the king. So these guys now, they don't understand. There is no such thing as an independent diplomacy. There is no such thing as war and peace, you know, the period of war is finished. The period of peace. That doesn't exist. Only fools believe that. <coughs> if you think there is no US war going on, go and live in Nicaragua and Cuba. If you think there is no Russian war going on, go and live in Afghanistan. You know. There's no condition of no fixed static condition of war or peace. That doesn't exist. <coughs> I always get, give the joke how in eighteen seventy six Satan Bull and some others Pull a fast tactical, it was a good tactical trick. And God caused her to go down to the little big horn, and surrounded him, and annihilated him. And four months later, sitting Bull is hiding out in Canada. You know, he thought he finished the war by defeating uh, the troops. It's like the fools are in the you weren't even alive, the Second World War, when Hitler sent von Paulus into Stalingrad. Van Paus was beaten, surrounded, killed, captured, made a Russian. The people believed the war was over. It lasted so many years after that, you know. Now, so this guy goes there to Galtree Forest and he says, Donald Lancaster, what are your grievances? And he gets a list of them and he goes and says, look, I, I agree. We, we grant you your grievances. These are, these are honorable things. And we agree. My uncle, the Duke, go and tell our troops to disband. You tell your troops to disband. We agree. And of course, these asses disbanded their troops. <laughs> His uncle never disbanded those troops. <laughs> but they just divide them, divide them up, and just capture them in detail in a restless lot. <laughs> the place says to itself, well, that's what happened. Now, that is called a balance of power play. You all, if you're in a power struggle, you always have to say, well, look, he said, you say this, all right, and we'll take account of what you said. But we must decide, no, suppose you are lying, what do we do? You have to play that way, or else you lose. You have to play that way. What is it Crazy Horse said in, um, he <coughs> said, the white man came and made us many promises. He broke every promise except one. He promised to take our land. He took it. <laughs> that one didn't break. <laughs> or or uh, what's the other one? Kenyatta in Kenya when I was an ambassador over there. Said the Englishmen came to Kenya and taught us religion. Christ, Paul, the apostles, Joseph, Mary, the whole Kabul, Martha, Lazarus. 
And the white man told us to lift our hands to pray to God in the heavens. And when we lifted our hands to pray to God in heaven, he stole the land from under our feet. <laughs> you know, it's the same story all the time. People who don't say, well, suppose you're lying. You know, suppose you're lying. Let me examine why you're saying what you're saying. But that's what happened at God's Street Forest. And uh, Shakespeare puts it in there as an examination of the kind of statecraft with which you have to deal. Your principles must be different. But you must expect your opponent might be the devil. And you can't expect the devil to have heavenly ideas. You know. It's like the stupid people, in, in, the liberals up here. Uh, Seven-year-old stabs parent, or five-year-old, whatever. It is. <coughs> they now start a whole case study, you know, and investigate why this five-year-old, seven-year-old stabbed the parent. Empirical studies, you know. May I remind you just, just on passing that Jesus Christ and Socrates never did case studies. You, you know that. <coughs> Jesus Christ didn't go around and say, hey, look, what do you think? Give me a poll here. <laughs> you know? Then say, ha, ah, we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You, you know. And of course, I always tell you guys that they, I, I used to teach at Rutgers. He couldn't teach here. Okay, you got to publish a book up here. <coughs> and neither Jesus Christ nor Socrates published a book. But you know this. I don't have to tell you that. 